Hello. So uh, for you just tuning in um, on the stream, I'm uh, Jan Henning Thorsen, and uh, I'm here to talk about uh, how to make um, modules that both need to feature uh, blocking, callback, and promises-based methods. So I'll try to get through all of this. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the differences are between non-blocking and blocking programming, and uh, why you might uh, choose one over the other. And then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is actually an I/O loop, like what what makes all of this work. And then I'll show um, an example about how you write a module that uses all of these three concepts. And then uh, at the end, I'll be uh, uh, giving some ideas about different things you might be interested in looking into on CPAN. And then at the final, uh, I'll probably have some bonus slides. So let's see how this goes. And I think I have a lot of time. So if someone has any questions while I'm talking, then uh, please just interrupt me and ask questions about the slides or the examples or whatever. OK, so first, what is uh, a blocking API, or what's a blocking method? Uh, what will that do? I guess everybody used this before. The idea here is that you call some sort of method, and your program stops on that line. So whatever the method is doing, you don't know if it's taking a long time to receive a, or to get a document or a query a database or whatever, but it's gonna stand there for uh, like seconds or minutes or hours or days or whatever until it's done. And you can call it in different uh, contexts. So you have maybe some methods that's gonna return something, something that might not have return method or something that throws an exception, but all of those will make sure that your program stops. This might be perfectly fine uh, if you just have one script that is doing one thing. But let's say if you're writing a web server or something that is supposed to be concurrent and, and um, do things in parallel, then you simply can't use this way of programming. So, uh, but uh, what about the callback-based API? The, um, uh, the callback-based API can be used in cooperative environments. And when I say cooperative environments, that means that all of the methods have to finish quickly. So it needs to, instead of like taking over an hour of, of the runtime of a method or your application, it needs to give, um, give back the responsibility for running something else really quickly. So um, that means that uh, this get users method need to be completed in maybe in milliseconds or hopefully even faster. Another thing that you can notice here is that um, the time before the get users method is called and whenever that method is done doing whatever it has to do, this sub block is gonna be called. And the time between get users and the sub block, uh, the time between those two uh, parts of the code, that is completely unknown. But that's okay. It's okay if it takes a second for get users or a second between get users and the sub block. Um, because uh, that means that uh, whatever other method you're running can get time to do their job. And also here uh, in the blocking example, you would have some sort of return value. But in a non-blocking context, you don't really care about the return value. So what you normally call a return value is the things that is passed into that sub-block. Sub so here you see that uh, the first argument is dollar $error or error or whatever you want to call it. And that's supposed to tell you if something went wrong or not. So instead of calling die or throwing an exception inside the blocking call, you need to pass that on as an argument. And the next argument that is sent in to the, uh, to the callback is the result of whatever uh, thing you want to uh, retrieve.
Okay, so now we talked a little bit about uh, blocking and callback based, but what about promise based APIs? So Sebastian talked a little bit about promises earlier today, but I'm hoping to dive a little bit deeper into that, that part uh, in this talk. Uh, a promise based API has the same uh, benefits as a callback based API. That means that whenever you call this get users underscore p method, it should be uh, it should complete in milliseconds or hopefully even faster. And then later on, you can call then or catch on that promise object, and that's going to add um, a fulfillment uh, callback or a, a rejection callback. So that means instead of in the callback based API, you will have two arguments here. But when you're using the promise based API, then you have then that's going to uh, get the results. Then you have the catch that is going to return or going to receive the error. Also, one thing to notice here is that this method this method on, uh, ends on underscore p, and that's a convention. So when you look at the method, you're instantly going to know that this one returns a promise. Okay, so why would you use uh, promises instead of blocking API? I'd like to explain this uh, with an uh, analogy. So let's say if you're in a, a workplace and you have this blocking coworker, then whenever you go to that coworker and give uh, him or her a task, you have to sit next to that coworker and wait for them to complete it. So you're like sitting there, waiting, waiting, and then when they are done, you get the response or the, uh, whatever result that they have um, uh, accomplished, and then you can go back to your desk, and then you can continue doing whatever you're doing. But if you have uh, a coworker that gives you a promise instead, let's say, I'll promise you that when I finish, I'm going to come over to your place, and I'm going to give back the result. Then you can go back to your desk, and you can continue doing whatever you like. And everybody else in the work environment, if they are doing the same things, then people can do things in parallel. So that would make it a lot quicker to finish different kinds of tasks. So uh, here's an example from the workplace. So you have uh, coworker number one. You tell that coworker to bring you coffee. Coworker number two, you tell that uh, person to write a, a report. And then <clears throat> uh, you're using all here to say that those two persons have to finish their, their tasks before getting back to you. But then in addition, just to make it all a little bit more fun, you wrap all of those premises into a race with a timer for one hour. So that means that if they haven't finished both bringing you coffee and writing the report in one hour, then you will still get some sort of result. So the timer goes off, and you're like dismissing whatever they were doing because they, they ran out of time. So I wouldn't suggest doing this. Like, I mean, some coworkers don't want to bring you coffee. And also, if you want to raise them on time, then they might be a little bit annoyed on you. So at the end here, you see that in the fulfillment uh, callback, you get either whatever response you get from the coworkers or the timer. <coughs> so uh, here, why would you use promises instead of callbacks? So a callback API, it's, uh, it gets really messy really quick. So first here, you have like something, you get users, and then you have a callback, and then if you didn't get an error, you're going to call a new method, and you're going to add a new callback, and then you can continue like this forever, and it's going to be really hard to read. And also, it's very easy to leak variables between the different callbacks. So maybe some t somewhere down the chain, you're going to try to use a variable that you didn't really have access to. And your code might run perfectly fine, but there are some weird bugs. <coughs> a promise-based API, on the other hand, it looks a little bit more sequential. So uh, this code, it doesn't have a lot of indentation, and it just reads a lot better. 
So one of the things here is that inside the first fulfillment callback, you call a new method that returns a new promise. And the next fulfillment um, callback won't be called until that promise that you return here is fulfilled. And also, if one of those uh, promises anywhere in this chain, if they incur uh, any error, then you only need to have one catch at the end. So the, the errors is going to propagate through all the, uh, all the promise objects and back to wherever your code is. So uh, what makes all of this non-blocking code work? That's the IO loop. And uh, what, what is an IO loop? An IO loop is something that can handle file descriptors. So uh, they can do stuff like um, this socket or file handle. Are you ready to, to uh, be written to? Or do you have any new data? But there's also timers. So with the, these three things, you can build amazingly complex applications on top uh, that run things in parallel. But how does this all go around? Like, why, why doesn't all of this like, block each other? Well, the thing is that most of the time, disk I.O. or getting a response from a remote server is relatively slow. So even if you're doing a database query and it's like only 50 milliseconds, then that's still an eternity for the CPU. So the CPU has a lot of time doing, uh, running a lot of your code locally while whatever you're waiting for um, executes. So let's say, for example, if you're fetching a, a document from a remote web server, that might take even a second. So the CPU, CPU today can do a lot of things. So uh, now I'm going to give some code example for how to uh, write a module. And uh, the core components here is the module IO loop and module promise. And uh, these are also core components in the modulicious framework. I like to say modulicious framework instead of web framework because it can actually do a lot of uh, other things than just doing web. So this example is a very, 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 very primitive user agent. So don't run this code at home, and certainly not in production. So it's not like a replacement for Mojo user agents, because there's so many things that you need to think about. But I was uh, thinking about using HTTP, because I think that's a protocol that at least everybody has heard about. So uh, this uh, start of the module, we, it's mostly a boilerplate. You define a package, and then you import the modules you need, and then you define two methods. So the first method here, get, will perform both the blocking and the non-blocking uh, versions, while get underscore p will return a promise that you can uh, use for fulfillment or rejection later on. OK, so I usually start out with uh, writing the promise uh, version first. And the reason why I do that is because I usually need that in my modulicious applications, because I like to write everything non-blocking so I can handle like a lot of requests in parallel. So uh, this method uh, accepts an URL, for example, uh, metacpan.org, and then it creates a promise. And this promise object is also the return value uh, at the bottom. So uh, after that, we use Mojo IO loop client. That's um, um, more of like a low-level uh, method for creating a TCP client. And we use that to connect to whatever host we specified in URL and the port. And then at some point in the, in the future, the, the sub-block here will be called. So then it's going to receive the error message, if any, and a stream object. And if we get an error, then it's going to uh, reject the promise uh, instantly. But if uh, you actually manage to connect to the server, we can uh, attach a, a read event, which will be called whenever the socket sends, uh, has received some data from the server. You don't know how many bytes there is here. So like, let's say if it's a huge web page, then maybe you'll lose data. So again, don't use this code anywhere. 
But what we'll do here is that we resolve the promise object, so then you get a fulfillment, which makes you happy, and you can go on with your program. At the very end, we just write uh, whatever data we need um, to the server. So if you see here, switching between the promise and the callback method, they're pretty similar. The only difference here is that instead of making a promise object, you pass in a callback, and then uh, later on, inside the sub, you call that callback with either the error or whatever bytes you received. So uh, as you see here, maybe we can share some code since it's so similar. Well, instead of sharing code, we can just use the promise method we, we just created. So here we, we still have a, a callback that we pass in, but instead of repeating all of that code, we just call the get underscore p method with the URL, and then on the fulfillment or the, or the rejection, then we, we call the callback. But it's very important when you do this uh, that you uh, remember the position. So don't do this, because if you pass on the first argument, uh, on both the fulfillment and the rejection, then there's no way for the, for the user of this API to know if there was an error or if it was okay. So always pass on uh, whatever arguments that you uh, define in your API. So uh, here's the blocking version of the code. And here you see that we, uh, we take an URL there's no callbacks, there's no, no promises, but what we do here is that we make a new IO loop uh, object. But wait, why would we use an IO loop if we're doing non-blocking? That's kind of weird. Well, the thing is that an IO loop is just like a while loop that runs forever until, until uh, it's supposed to stop. So creating a new IO loop object will prevent you from calling any other events in the, in the main IO loop, but instead, at the bottom here, where you start the IO loop, it's just gonna run there in a while loop until whatever code you put into the client uh, is fulfilled. Another thing that I like to do, and I think a lot of the non-blocking API uh, modules do this, is that if you have an error, instead of returning um, two things from that met method, you just die on the error. And the reason why I like to die is that it's so easy to forget to check for the error. Say, for example, if anyone has done a low-level open a file, how often do you forget to check the return value from open? I know I've done it plenty of times at least. Okay, so uh, what about uh, can we reuse the promises method when we're doing non-blocking? Well, no or at least most of the time you can't. And the reason for this is that if you, if you have one IO loop that runs a while loop, then there's no way to jump into the other IO loop or the, the other while loop in the other IO loop. So you need to like contain your blocking uh, IO loops in, uh, in one place and the non-blocking IO loops in, different, um, in uh, different IO loops. So that's why there's a singleton in the framework. So most of the methods you call, they use this singleton for non-blocking things, and then you create new IO loops for doing the blocking. So uh, the alternative would be to factor out a lot of the code. So let's say if you actually wrote on a user agent, you would uh, factor out the things that crafted the request and stuff like that. So how do you know if you're a blocking or non-blocking context? Well, the way you do it is you check if the last argument is a code ref. And then if you have a callback, then you run the blocking version of the code. And if you don't have a callback, then you run the non-blocking version. So how would it look using this uh, amazingly basic user agent? Well, the first version here is blocking. So that means that each, uh, each line of the code have to run before going to the next one. But on the other example here, you use mojo promises all, and you pass in two promises to that method, 
And that means that both those requests can run in parallel. So maybe you won't run in half of the time, but at least you're going to run a lot faster. And uh, one thing to notice here is that in the, when you use all, then all of the arguments that it normally is passed on to the fulfillment callback, they are passed on as array refs. So instead of just getting whatever res result you get here from the two uh, promises, you need to sort of unpack or unwrap the arguments. Okay, so uh, what else might you be interested in? So, um, talked a little bit about all and race. Here you can see that those two methods are called on the class instead of an instance of module promise. And the reason for that is that, like I told you earlier, you can't block, uh, you can't mix blocking and non-blocking code. So let's say if you have a lot of objects or a lot of IO loop objects, then it's very hard to figure out which of those IO loop, uh, loop objects to use. So that means if you want to race, um, multiple promises, or if you want to use all to run them concurrently, you need to use the, the main IO loop object. <clears throat> Another thing you might notice when you're reading code is that sometimes you attach wait at the end. And the thing that wait does is that it's going to start the IO loop if it's not already running. So I actually use this quite often when I write scripts. So instead of using blocking versions at all, I just attach a wait at the end, and then my script is going to run down, block at that place in the code, do whatever it's going to do, and then continue to the next stage. So uh, another example, let's say if you are uh, already written a, lot, a bunch of code that, has, uh, uh, that is using callbacks, how would you go on migrating that into promises? Well, what you can do here is to, to do it the other way around. So you define the new method, the promise-based method, and then you create a new promise, and then inside the callback, you can reject or resolve it. So this is the other way of going around. So instead of making your promises first, you, could, you, you can keep on using your callback. I like doing everything promises-based first now, since, uh, like I said, that's what I need to use anyways. So I tried to avoid this version, but that's probably the fastest way to migrate all your old code. So uh, what else might you be interested in? Marcus Ramberg has written a plugin called Promise Actions. And uh, what that does is that it's going to check for errors and, uh, and make sure that, uh, uh, that auto-rendering and stuff like that is disabled. So the way you use it is just that you load the plugin, Promise Actions, and then at the end of uh, any action that you have, you return the Promise object. And then the way Marcus's code work is that that Promise <coughs> is stored into $rest here, and then if that's actually a Promise, then it's going to um, uh, check later that if you had an error, it will automatically render a 500 internal server error. So again, it's very easy to forget to check for errors. So using his plugin makes it a lot easier. And also it keeps the, t uh, the transaction object alive and stuff like that. So it's kind of a replacement for the old delay helper. Okay, so now on to the bonus slides. This is going way too quick. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. Explain race. Explain race and all. Okay. I've, I've never seen promises before. Right. Promise. So let's go back to the coworker example here. So to dig into this, when you say promise all, then you give it a list of, of promises objects. And in, in, internally in that method, it's going to wait for all of them to be fulfilled before calling them. 
So let's say if you attach done at the end here, that fulfillment callback won't be called until both of those promises are done running. So this is very, very easy. Let's say if you want to request documents from 10 different web servers and then mix them together or do whatever you like, then it's super easy using the Mojo uh, user agent. And you just call get underscore p or post underscore p or whatever you need to do. And both, all of those methods are going to return a promise object. So it makes it so much easier to read. Because then you say that, OK, when, whenever all of you guys are done doing whatever you need to do, then call the fulfillment callback. Did that answer? Yeah. Uh, OK, you've done all. Great. Great. Right. So uh, oh, another thing worth mentioning is that if, uh, if, there's, um, if, uh, if there's a rejection, let's say if some of them fail, then it's going to propagate, and your re rejection, or the, the catch method is going to be called. OK, so what about race? Then it's going to say, OK, do all of these things in parallel. But whoever finished first, that's the thing that's going to be passed on to them. So if you use all, then you're going to get a list of error refs uh, in your then callback. But if you use race, then you're only getting one of them. So let's say if you're trying to figure out, so is, uh, is uh, metacpan.org faster than searchcpan.org, for example? You could pass in two get requests to race. And then you could inspect the transaction object in the, in the um, fulfillment callback to see which host uh, responded uh, quicker. OK. Um, you said that it responds to the first response that it gets. What if the first response is a rejection, like meta, uh, search CPAN is down and it comes back faster? Any rejection propagates through the chain. OK. Brad, a short, way, a short answer to that is that all is and function, and erase is an all function. Yeah. But, yeah. So, but one of the problems here that, or not the problems, the nice thing about all is that, let's say if you said, get a document from your server first, then my server as number two, then you're also going to know that that's also the order in the, in the fulfillment. So it's not like the first one will be the first argument passed in, and the second, or the, the one that finished last, will be the last one. It's going to be in the same order as you specify the promises. So unless you wouldn't, like, which one is which, it would be impossible to track that. But on the other hand, with the race, you need to inspect the, the the argument passed into the fulfillment to figure out which one won. So let's see here, for example, you're raising a coworker with a timer. And then let's say if the timer finished, you have to like figure out was is this a timer or is it like the coworker thing? I get it. <laughs> so this code is actually wrong because if there's a, if the coworkers finish, then you're gonna get no sorry, it's a race. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you say anything about the use cases for multiply, uh, running multiple uh, IO loops? Uh, at the same time? Yeah. Well, it, it just doesn't work. It doesn't. No, because basically uh, um, uh, an IO loop is while one and then some code inside. And the three things it does, it's like check if a file handle is writable, and if it is, flush something out on that file handle. Second is, is it readable? If that's the case, read some data and do something. And third is, uh, is there any timer that has uh, expired, or should I call the timer callback? So that means that inside that one, you need to manually call. OK, so the IO loop has, um, <coughs> please help me out here. Is it, it's not next tick, is it? Is it next tick that calls like one tick for the IO loop? Right. One tick, right, exactly. The next tick is for calling zero seconds into the future. So what you, in theory, I guess you could like have a recurring timer that calls one tick on another I loop, but it's just going to be a huge mess. 
What? It explodes. It explodes. <laughs> Yeah, that's true, right? Uh, you have to repeat what for the microphone call. Yeah, so the the call stack uh, stack is going to explode if you if you do because it's going to be recursive. So that's the main problem. Or I mean, it's not the main problem. The main problem is just that it's crazy. But the main, <laughs> but the actual program uh, problem for Perl is that the call stack is going to grow. Except if we get async event await maybe. <laughs> any, any more questions? Right. Yeah. You have a bonus slide. Yes. So. Okay. Um, I'm doing Open API version two stuff on CPAN, and if anyone has used Open API clients, then I can tell you now that you used to do, you used to have to do call underscore p on the operation ID, but now I'm injecting all of those methods as, as well, so you can do whatever operation ID underscore P directly on the client. <laughs> and is anyone using Mojo Redis 2? Oh no, why do you? <laughs> Joel, why do you use it? <laughs> Anyways, Mojo Redis, that's um, available on CPAN. It's a lot easier to read the actual source code. It's easier to maintain. It does a lot of new clever things that Mojo Redis 2 doesn't do. And you can use it with promises. OK, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And if you have any questions about this or OpenAPR or whatever I'm doing on CPAN, the CGI plugin, for example, then uh, come, and, come and ask me. Thanks for listening. Thank you. So next talk starts.